All right, welcome. Welcome back to our Wednesday evening Bible study. We've been going through the book of Revelation. We're in chapter 4 now, and uh, we have been studying the last few weeks on uh, the church in Philadelphia. Uh, look at uh, Revelation chapter 4, verse 7 with me. <clears throat> and the Bible says in... Uh, hold on. I'm sorry, Revelation chapter 3. I got ahead of myself. Revelation chapter 3. And verse 7, it says, And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth, and no man shutteth, and shutteth, and no man openeth. Verse 8, I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Let's pray, and we'll get into this evening's uh, lesson. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for these letters that you sent to the, the early churches and for preserving them for us that we may benefit and gain from them as well as we study uh, this letter uh, to the church in Philadelphia this evening. We pray that you'd help us, that we would learn from it, that we would uh, gain from it and, and uh, uh, allow you to teach us and lead and guide us. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, last, last week we... Um, we're in verse 8 here, and of course Jesus says to this church, he says, I know thy works, and then he says, Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. And then he says, Four, and then there's three things. And so he says, I've opened this door for you, and no man can shut it because of these three things. And of course the first thing that he mentioned there, he says, Thou hast a little strength. So we mentioned last week, God's people have, uh, the only time they were ever in the majority was at the very beginning um, when there was two of them and before they sinned. And then immediately after the flood, those that got off of the boat, 100% of them were God's people. And they quickly began to multiply. And as they did, the subsequent generations got further and further away from God. So for the most part, throughout history, uh, of mankind, God's people have been in the minority. Uh, <clears throat> that day, of course, will change, um, but we're not there yet. And so he says, thou hast uh, a little strength. And so while numerically small, uh, there's a, a good and wonderful saying, little is much when God is in it. And so you and God make the majority. By the way, God without you still makes a majority. He doesn't need you, but if you want to be in the majority, make sure you're on God's side. Now let's get into the next thing. So the first thing, thou hast a little strength. And, and the next statement he says, uh, and has kept my word. Thou hast kept my word. Uh, here, here's an interesting thing. I, I remember hearing a preacher uh, years ago make a statement. He said that each generation will have to defend the King James Bible. Each generation will have to make a stand for it. And at the time I thought, well, he's talking about, he's talking about the fundamental Baptists will always have to stand against the liberals who, who don't accept the Word of God for the Word of God. And they would rather change the Bible than allow the Bible to change them. And, and yes, I, I thought, yeah, absolutely, we're, we're going to have to stand against that mentality, uh, uh, that teaching, that belief system, and that wasn't what he meant though. He meant that within, within Christianity, within those that, that have for generations and years and years and years and years have accepted the King James Bible as the Word of God, there will arise within them a group that rejects it and that denies it and goes against it. Um, and, and I just, I thought, that was settled a long time ago. That was settled when, and then I remember when, when I was just a, a young boy, a child, and that being, there being a controversy amongst fundamentalists uh, about the King James Bible. And, and, uh, and then I remember, okay, that controversy got settled. And I thought, that, you know, it doesn't need to be brought up anymore. And... And, well, I'll, I'll say I was wrong, and he was right. That word, that word where it says, thou hast, or, uh, and hast kept my word. 
and has kept my word. That word kept means this. It means to guard from loss or injury. To guard from loss or injury. And the fact of the matter is, there are those, there, are, there is a group, there's a movement, there's someone who would like to cause loss to the Word of God. Um, the, a lot of the new so-called, well, they're not even called translations, they're called versions, and a lot of the most popular ones are missing tens of thousands of words. Loss has been caused, and, and somebody failed to guard, uh, to keep, that from being lost. I mean, entire verses, entire passages. You look in the Bible where, where the Bible talks about uh, the Trinity, about there being three that bear record in heaven, and these three being one. They'll just leave those verses out completely. And, and so that causes injury. A lot of people say, well, you know, it's just a different way of wording things, and it doesn't really change the meaning at all. Well, when you when you take the word virgin out and you put in the word young lady, that does change the meaning. That causes injury to the doctrine. That causes injury to the truth. And so God said about the church in Philadelphia, He said, here's something, I've opened a door for you. And I've done it because you still have some strength. You've kept, you, you've kept yourself on my side. And He said, you've, you've preserved or you've fought, you've defended my word and preserved it, you've guarded it from loss, and you've guarded it from injury. And he said, because of, and he said, here's three things, and because of these three things, I'll keep this door open for you. Now that tells me that as we fail to do those three things, then God's not obligated to keep any door open for us. And so when we say, well, it seems like that door is, is being closed. Um, you know, it used to be, our government would pay for the printing of Bibles. I mean, our federal government at one time said, you know, it would be a good idea if, if more people had the Word of God. Uh, you go to Washington, D.C., and, and the monuments that were built long, long, long ago, I mean, a long time ago, uh, they all have Scripture uh, inscribed, I mean, chiseled out in the stone. There's verses. There's Scripture all over the place. And, and now... Boy, monuments that are put up, you know, people say, well, we don't, we don't even like this uh, Ohio, the state motto of Ohio to be printed. And it's, you know, with God, all things are possible. They, and, you know, these people say, well, I just don't, I don't like scripture. Well, don't use money because it says in God we trust. Um, <clears throat> and so, and, and so, you know, give back when your employer tries to pay you, you give all that money back and, and everything else and, and, and make sure you're well offended by it. Uh, <clears throat> but, see, our, our country has gotten away from that. Um, no more prayer in schools. Uh, no more reading of the Bible at the beginning of the day in schools. They can't even hang um, a plaque with the Ten Commandments on it in the hallway of a public school. And so we, we have, uh, as a country, we have failed to... Keep God's word. We failed to stay on His side. We failed to use the strength that we have to do good, to do right. To, and so God says, "Well, if you're not gonna, if you're not gonna go through that open door, I'm not gonna keep holding it for you." And so slowly and little by little, doors have been closing in our in our country, and, and they'll continue to do so uh, as long as God's people don't do these three things. And if they're not using the strength that God has given them. To stand for what's right. I, I was talking to a fellow today, and he said he was talking about the the school that he attended. He grew up in this school, attended that school, and then his son attended the same school. And he said, "You know what? There's things going on in that school now. Uh, I couldn't believe it." And uh, clubs and organizations. He said they've got a they've got a pride club in that school. I said, "Boy." You'd be hard-pressed to start a straight pride club in that school, but they'd, they'd run you out of town. He said, I know. And, and uh, I said, it's, it, you need a different school board. He said, well, those same members have been on there since I was there. I said, well, somebody needs to go around door to door and tell people, here's what these people have voted in. And, and schools throughout the country and throughout our state are, are bringing in this critical race theory and, and saying that just, you know, to say that just because your skin is white there's a problem with you, that's racist right there. 
uh, <clears throat> and that shouldn't be taught anywhere. Uh, it shouldn't be taught that just because you have a certain color of skin that there's something wrong or inferior about it. That's a, that's a racist statement. And so you look at you look at the statements they're making about white people. If those same statements were made about somebody of any other color, they would acknowledge them as being racist. And so that's a, that's the test for that. But anyway, so uh, the the we we've been failing. We've been failing at these things. And so God is not obligated to keep these doors open. But as we keep these three things, and one of them is He said, "Thou hast kept my word." Uh, these people were true to the gospel. These people were loyal to the word of Christ. Uh, I, I believe that the attack on the words of God started er, as soon as we started getting the words of God. God met with Adam in the garden and gave him some commands and gave him some words. And the very first thing that we, that we find the serpent, uh, that old serpent the devil, saying to Eve is, Yea, hath God said. The very first words that we have recorded of him communicating with mankind is calling into question the words of God and a direct attack on it. And that has not changed in, in over 6,000 years. That's been the, the way it goes. And so we must stand true. And, and I can't make a big enough deal about, for the English-speaking people, the King James translation. Um, they didn't yield to the majority that would raise doubts and speculations about the Word of God. And they stay true, and they didn't just stay true, but they stay protective of it. And they, they assume the role of, of guarding from loss or injury uh, to the Word of God. Today, and I believe this was going on in, in the day of the Church of Philadelphia in the first century, uh, <clears throat> there was a, uh, the inerrancy of God's Word was questioned, and it's still being questioned. Uh, there was there was a fellow that was uh, visiting here years ago, years ago. His brother was attending, and he decided to come visit, and and he had been going to a different church, and uh, uh, or maybe I should say a, di a different religious organization. Uh, the Bible would not have defined them as a church, but anyhow, uh, the man who stood up and delivered the message to them uh, week after week. Um, <clears throat> they uh, they went back after they had attended here, and um, I had I had made an issue. I said, you know, we we use the King James Bible, and it's the only one that's that's without error. Uh, it's for the English speaking people. These are the very words of God, brought over from the original languages that God used to deliver them to man, and and it's a translation. It's not a version. And so they went back and they, they said, well, we, were, we heard from this other preacher that we need to use the King James Bible. Now, they're at, their, at, at their meeting, they were not using the King James Bible. And here's what that man said, that they, he called himself a preacher. But he said, well, he said, that's, that's ridiculous. Just whichever one you like the best, whichever one's the easiest one for you to read, you just go ahead and pick that one out. And they said, well... We, we were told and we were shown where these other ones have errors. He said, well, no, he said, that's all. He said, you could look at any of them. You could look at the King James Bible and find stuff that, that's, that's just really not so. Now, here's a man calling himself a preacher, and he's saying that the Bible's just not, really not so. Um, and he went on to say, he said, he said for, and they, they looked at him kind of puzzled, and you know, because they had kind of been taught when they were young that, the Bible is the Word of God. And so he said, for example, you don't really believe that Jonah was swallowed by a whale, do you? And I thought, and that's why I refuse to call him a preacher. Because if, if you're going to call yourself a preacher, then you need to stand with the Word of God. And the fact is, the Bible says Jonah was swallowed by a whale. That's what I believe. If the Bible had said Jonah was the one that swallowed the whale. Then that's what I would believe. But that's not what it says. It says God prepared a whale. He prepared him specifically for that. And that whale swallowed him up. And he was there three days and three nights. And then he decided he didn't like that neighborhood anymore. He didn't like living there. And uh, he said, all right, I'll do what you want me to do. And God caused the, the whale to, to regurgitate him. And uh, 
Jonah went on in, into the city that God had told him to go to, and he gave them the message that God said to deliver. Now listen, uh, <clears throat> I don't care what anybody else says or what they think or what they, they want to think. The Bible is the Word of God, and it's going to be questioned. And, and realize, when you question the Word of God, then you're aligning yourself with somebody else. You're not aligning yourself with God. You're aligning yourself against Him. And, and uh, the, very first, the very first thing Satan did in his interaction with man was question the Word of God. And he said, Yea, hath God said. Did God really say that? And then he went on and absolutely contradicted and said, God didn't really mean that. God, God's trying to keep something good for you and twisted it and manipulated it and, and everything else. So this, has, uh, this has been an issue amongst Baptists. And I thought it's been put to rest, it's been settled, and no. As I grew up and God called me to, to preach and, and put me behind the pulpit, I saw it. And I'd say uh, uh, amongst people in my generation called question upon the Word of God. And they said, well, really, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not without error. They, they were saying uh, the King James Bible is not inspired. It was simply... It was simply uh, uh, preserved, but not inspired. Well, if, if the word in the original language is inspired, and all you did was move that, move that same word into English, if, as long as it's the same word, it's inspired. It's, you know, we use that word translate, and that means to take from somewhere else and, and bring it to a new location. Enoch was translated. He's still Enoch. He's just not here. He's in a different place. When you take a word from a different language and bring it here, bring it, it's translated into English, it's still the same word. It's still going to be inspired. And so, uh, by the way, that man who, who said the King James Bible was not inspired, God took his hand off of him, and he's in prison today. Uh, and so I'd be very careful about attacking the Word of God when you know better. And... and uh, God said that's, that's the one thing where God says we're, we're allowed to earnestly contend. If we, you want to you fight, God said, you can fight to defend my word. Uh, <clears throat> but, but anyhow, um, some have said that only 4% of those preachers in the pulpits on Sunday believe that the Bible is the verbal, inerrant, infallible word of God. I would say that that percentage is much smaller now. It's much smaller now fellow that used to teach Sunday school here when I was a teenager. Well, actually, I was almost a teenager, and he was teaching Sunday school here, and he went to visit a friend in, in, uh, in the hospital, and uh, uh, he had his, his Bible with him, and he got on the elevator, and, and a woman got on the elevator with him <clears throat> as he was leaving, and, and uh, uh, she said, uh, are you a preacher? He said, no. He said, I, I'm a Christian. I'm just visiting a friend that's here in the hospital. And she said, oh, well, well I'm, I'm a pastor. And uh, he said, no, you're not. <laughs> and she said, well, yes, I am. And he said, no, you're not. And, and she argued with him for a little bit. She said, why do you keep saying that I'm not? She said, I got a business card here. And, and she pulled out a business card and it had her name on it and, and listed as the pastor of uh, such and such church. He said, I don't care what the business card says. Um, he said, you're not a pastor. Anybody can have a business card printed up and it can say anything you want it to say. And she said, but I am the pastor. And, and he said, well, no, you're not. And she said, why do you keep saying that? And so he opened his Bible up and he said, look here. He said, a pastor has, has to be the husband of one wife. And, and uh, um, every time the Bible refers to as a pastor, it, it uses uh, male terminology. He said, you have to be a man to be a pastor. And she said, well, I'm the pastor of that church. He said, no, you're not. He said, the Bible says you can't be. And here's what, here's what that woman said in that elevator. She said, I don't care what that book says. I'm the pastor. Well, folks, she ought to get an honest job. She ought to quit standing in front of people Sunday after Sunday and lying to them and lying to herself how can somebody claim to be they're delivering God's message and then say, I don't care what his book says. I'm going to do and I'm going to proclaim whatever I want to. 
And so, uh, uh, <clears throat> certainly, God's removed his hand from that organization. God doesn't blame us for having little strength. But little faith, and for not standing with his word, and these Christians at Philadelphia kept the word of God. That doesn't mean, well, well I'm just going to keep this and not, and, and not give it away. That's not what the word keep means in the Bible. It means to protect. It means to guard. Um, and so these, these Philadelphians had done that. They had received the word of God by faith. They had believed the word of God. They had loved the word of God. They had obeyed the word of God. They had proclaimed the word of God as the word of God. And they had, uh, they had uh, guarded it and protected it. They considered the word of God as a treasure. And they guarded it as, as such. The Bible says, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. That's something I've, I've hid away. I've, I've, I've treasured it all the way into my heart. Uh, let's see, what time do we have here? Uh, let's see, let's, uh, we'll, we'll get started on the third thing. I don't think we'll quite get done with it. Uh, <clears throat> but we will get started here. Uh, so the first thing was, yes, thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word. And then the third thing in verse 8, and hast not denied my name. Has not denied my name. And someone once said, you know, everybody will get along with you if, if, if all you do is believe in God. But if you start, if you start talking about Jesus, that's where division comes into play. And, and that's absolutely the case. Well, there's a lot of places. They'll, they'll let you talk about God. They'll let you, they'll, they'll let you mention God. But as soon as you start saying Jesus, they, uh, well, you're not going to be welcome there anymore. Uh, the fellow that, that started uh, Reformers Unanimous, he had, a, he had a problem with addiction. And he, he came back to God, started going back to church, long hair and all, and, and um, because he had been in a car wreck. And the only person that visited him in the hospital were not his drug dealers and his drug doing buddies, or, you know, so-called buddies. His old Sunday school teacher came to see him in the hospital, sat with him and prayed with him, and, and was just there with him. And he realized that these, all these people that I've supposedly been having this good time with, none of them are my friends. The world is not my friend. And he got back into church and got his life turned around, but he was reading his Bible, and he started going to AA and NA and, and all the all the Addictions Anonymous programs that are out there, and basically they're all Alcoholics Anonymous based programs, which the men that came up with Alcoholics Anonymous basically used a Ouija board to do it. Uh, <clears throat> so and they said, well, no, 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 you have to believe in a higher power. And he realized that he went in there and in his mind that higher power was God. And they said, well, yeah, if, if you want to call him God, that's okay. And he was reading his Bible one day, and he said, uh, um, And he shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. And he said, "That's what, I need to be set free. He felt like he was in bondage to, to these drugs and to alcohol. And, uh, and then he, he saw where Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And he said, There it is. Jesus is the truth. And he was so excited. He said, All I need to do is get to know Jesus better and the better I get to know him, the, the freer I'll be. And he realized that was the key to his freedom from the bondage of, uh, of addiction. And so he, he couldn't wait till the next meeting. And he went to the next meeting, and, and you know everybody gets a turn to talk if they want to talk. And he was so excited when, when, uh, uh, to get a turn, and he says, I, I found the key. I found the key. And he said, uh, uh, he said I was reading my Bible, and it said... Uh, uh, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. And then I was reading another place where Jesus, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And the fellow guiding the meeting, he said, you can't talk about him here. Now, he was allowed to mention God or a God, but as soon as he mentioned Jesus, they said, no, 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 you can't talk about Jesus in here. 
And, and immediately he, he realized, this is not a Christian organization at all. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you right now, when somebody says, you can't talk about Jesus in here, that is anti-Christ. Um, am I saying Alcoholics Anonymous is the Antichrist? Not with a capital A. It's, it's uh, small. It's, it's, they're not for Christ. When you can't go in and talk about Jesus, that's anti, that's against Christ. Uh, <clears throat> same thing, there's, other, there's fraternal organizations, and, and they'll say, well, look, we have, we have an altar in the front of our room, and on that altar is a King James Bible. Yes, in the United States of America, most of uh, your Freemason lodges will have that. In Saudi Arabia, they won't. They'll have a Koran. In India, they won't. They'll have, they'll have uh, another book, perhaps uh, the Vedas or something like that. Uh, they're not a Christian organization. Oh, well, we, pr we have prayer. Yeah, and as soon as you start saying, in Jesus' name... As soon as you talk about Jesus, they'll pull you aside and say, can't talk about him in here. That is an anti-Christ organization. And here, God commends the church in Philadelphia. He said, one of the things, he said, there's three things that you're doing that keeps this door open. The doors that I've opened for you, he said, you've, you, you, you've got a little strength. You're staying strong to, uh, with me. You've protected and guarded my word. That has kept my word. And has not denied my name. The name of Christ in the Bible stands for all that He is. He's Savior. He's Master. He's Mediator. He is Messiah. His name tells us of His deity, His honor, His glory, His majesty, His holiness. His eternity, His omnipotence, His omniscience, and His om, uh, uh, omnipresence. You know, interesting, he, he says uh, in verse 7, To the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy. The very first way in which he identifies himself is he that is holy. And, and holy, the Bible tells us, is the name of Jesus. Sinners are saved by faith. Uh, they're saved through faith in His name. Uh, turn, let's, uh, let's see, we'll look at a few verses along this line of thought and we'll finish uh, with that tonight. Let's go to Matthew chapter 1. There was a very well-known evangelist a few years back. Was He was interviewed on... On CNN, I, I want to. For some reason, I'm thinking it's Larry King that interviewed this guy. And if I called his name, you'd know I was talking about Billy Graham, because that's who said this. <laughs> he was asked about people who had never heard about Jesus and if they could get to heaven, and and he said that that he believed they could. Now, he was wrong because the Bible says there's no salvation outside of Jesus. Look at Matthew chapter 1, verse 21. It's talking about uh, Mary is being spoken to, or, or about, it says, And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. So because of that name, they said, you're going to call him Jesus because he's going to be the Savior uh, he's going to save people from their sins. Turn with me to John chapter 1. John chapter 1. And verse 12. It says, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Without the name of Jesus, it's not just a matter of believing in something, in some generic and some unknown. It's a very specific belief. Romans chapter 10. Turn there with me, please. Romans chapter 10. And verse 13 says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord 
shall be saved. Very clear. Very clear there. The calling upon the name of the Lord. Let's turn back to Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4 and verse 12. If you need it a little bit more specific and a little bit more clear, the Bible says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. There's only one name. There's only one name through which we can uh, uh, receive salvation. John chapter 3 verse 18 tells us that those that have not believed are condemned already. The name of Jesus. There's no salvation without it. And it's not, well, this, this group calls him a different name, and this group calls him the Great Spirit, and this group calls him Allah, and this group calls him that. Well, those are not different names for the same person. Those are different names for different entities. The name of the Savior is Jesus. And there's no salvation in any other name. That's so very, very crucial. And... and uh, Satan would like you to think, well, you can put your faith in some other name because he doesn't want you to go to heaven. And God said, I'm going to make it very clear and very specific and, and very easy to know the only way to heaven is, is through Jesus. And without Jesus, there's no attaining heaven. Let's stand tonight and we'll close with a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for giving us Jesus and preserving his name for us that we may know him and that we may know him as Savior. We pray that anybody that sees this, uh, watches it and hears it, uh, that doesn't know Christ as Savior, that they would come to know him. Lord, those of us that do, may we hold true to that name and always uh, uh, please give us boldness to, to speak his name and to share the good news with others. We pray and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord bless you.